The American poet Kenneth Rexroth remains known, aside from his immense literary output over the course of many decades, as being the only literary or poetic figure to have both owned a brothel and lived in a monastery. Contradiction, paradox, and synthesis marked his long career, spanning almost the entirety of the 20th century. Weaving and wading through the major artistic and cultural movements of his time, Rexroth sought to embody the totality of the history of ideas in his continued poetic search for enlightenment, devoted to a search for knowledge in both Eastern and Western traditions. Writing after his passing in the 80s, a friend and former student described Rexroth as a, quote, longtime iconoclast, one-time radical, Roman Catholic, communist fellow traveler, jazz scholar, IWW anarchist, translator, philosopher, playwright, librettist, orientalist, essayist, radio host, columnist, painter, poet, and longtime Buddhist. Born in 1905 in South Bend, Indiana, Rex Roth was orphaned by the age of 14. Sent to live with his aunt, he was quickly expelled from school, ending his formal education abruptly. He spent time in his youth in Chicago, briefly imprisoned on charges of brothel ownership after a bar raid. Following his release, he became immersed in the struggles of Chicago's working classes. He hitchhiked across the country, spending time as a monastery candidate before leaving to travel Europe. He left after a few months, backpacked through the hobo camps of Depression America, and worked as a roustabout and fire lookout in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest. While employed by the WPA during the Depression, Rexroth wrote trail guides for the national parks, drifting on to settle more or less permanently on the West Coast. He was drawn west because of its distances from the literary shadow of New York City. Rexroth found in San Francisco the backwater town on the edge of America he'd been searching for. Building upon his early involvement in old left political circles, Rexroth joined the San Francisco labor movement, publishing The Waterfront Worker, a small labor publication he distributed to longshoremen, resulting in a strike. He also organized with the Agricultural Workers Industrial Union in the fields of California. In an interview, Rexroth comments on John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, saying that, quote, one-eighth of the book is true. In the novel, one guy gets killed. In a Bakersfield cotton strike to which I took Steinbeck, eight guys got killed, end quote. A lifelong pacifist, Rexroth objected to every armed conflict since the First World War. After vocally protesting the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, Rexroth declared his, quote, disaffiliation from the American capitalist state, end quote. In 1940, his first collection of poems was published, followed in 1944 by The Phoenix and the Tortoise, which was released on the New Directions imprint. New Directions, operated by James Laughlin, printed the majority of Rexroth's output, giving him a sustained platform to develop several longer poems, all defined by their explorations of love as a universal sacrament of transcendence. Rexroth navigated freely and ranged widely through the history of ideas in his poetry. He was at home in philosophy, comparative religion, anthropology, and linguistics. He had more in common intellectually with the ancient Greeks than his 20th century comrades, clearly a kind of neoclassicist engaged in the avant-garde. His early embrace of ancient Chinese poetry and successful series of translations of Asian literature, specifically those of female poets, brought much academic attention to a nearly forgotten literary category. A keen ecological awareness flows through much of Rexroth's output with numerous references to our ecological crisis punctuating his written essays. His poems are loaded with descriptions of taxonomy, biology, botany, geology, and astronomy, with the cycles of nature a constant presence informed by a lifetime of mountain climbing and outdoor exploration. Despite exhibiting a breadth of literary knowledge throughout his work and a mastery of Latin, Greek, and several Romance languages, Rexroth spent the majority of, of his career outside the world of universities, opting instead for companionship 
along the fringes of society. He felt strongly that the state, the church, and universities produced nothing but racism, sexism, and academic art, referring to academics as, quote, corn belt metaphysicals and country gentlemen, end quote. He organized political and literary circles throughout his life, giving momentum to the careers of many younger poets and artists while tirelessly developing his own poetic voice. In addition to his poetry, Rexroth wrote essays and nonfiction on a wide array of topics from contemporary culture to the ancient Gnostic mysteries. His infamous radio broadcasts on Berkeley KPFA provided an outlet for the promotion of poets and writers, readings, and guest interviews. Rexroth helped to establish both the Pacifica Foundation and the Poetry Center at San Francisco State College. Rexroth promoted the emerging beat poets as they rose to prominence in the 50s. He substantially soured on the movement when it reached national spotlight. Time magazine, in a retrospective piece on the mid-century literary renaissance, dubbed Rexroth the father of the beat generation, to which he replied, an entomologist is not a bug. He organized the famous Six Gallery Reading, held in 1955, where Allen Ginsberg first read his poem, How. The event is immortalized in Jack Kerouac's The Dharma Bums, a novel where Rexroth is portrayed in an unflattering portrait. Depicted as a crotchety elderly anarchist poet who accompanies Jack and a fictionalized Gary Snyder as they explore Buddhism and mountain climbing. Rexroth ventured into the record business, producing two long playing albums of his own live poetry backed by a jazz group, a technique he used in numerous live performances. But by the close of the 1950s, Rexroth found himself broke and at the end of his second marriage, suffering from severe bouts of paranoia. He continued to publish, writing essays and nonfiction, as well as working on his famous translations of ancient Chinese poetry. In the late 60s, he moved to Santa Barbara, taking a position as a lecturer at the University of California. Finally entering academia officially, he drew hundreds of students into his classes for an unconventional and wide-ranging seminar series. Speaking on his own search in his work for a poetic voice, Rexroth commented, quote, I have spent my life striving to write the way I talk. Rexroth is equally a poet of nature, society, transcendence, mysticism, politics, the ancient, the modern, and ultimately the world itself. Exploring his work immerses the attentive and inquisitive reader in deep waters. Rexroth's epitaph, carved on his headstone facing the sea in Santa Barbara, reads, As the full moon rises, the swan sings, in sleep on the lake of the mind. This is called Lyle's Hypothesis again. Lyle's Hypothesis on the Subtitle says of uh, Lyle's Principles of Geology, uh, and this is a regnant uh, scientific principle, modern geology, an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by causes now in operation. <laughs> the mountain road ends here, broken away in the chasm where the bridge washed out years ago. The first scarlet larkspur glitters in the first patch of April morning sunlight. The engorged creek roars and rustles like a military ball. Here by the waterfall, insuperable life flush with the equinox, sentient and sentimental falls away to the sea and death. The tissue of sympathy and agony that binds the flesh in its nessus shirt the clotted cobweb of unself and self sheds itself and flecks the sun's bed with darts of blossom like flagellant blood above the water bursting in the vibrant air. This ego bound by personal tragedy and the vast impersonal vindictiveness of the ruined and ruining world pauses in this immortality as passionate, as apathetic, as the lava flow that burned here once and stopped here and said this far no further and spoke thereafter in the simple diction of stone. Naked in the warm April air, 
We lie under the redwoods in the sunny lee of a cliff. As you kneel above me, I see tiny red marks on your flanks, like bites where the redwood cones have pressed into your flesh. You can find just the same marks in the lignite in the cliff over our heads. Sequoia longs Dorfi before the ice and Sempervirens afterwards. And there is little difference except for all those years. Here in the sweet moribund fetter of spring flowers washed, flotsam and jetsam together, cool and naked together, under this tree for a moment, we have escaped the bitterness of love, love lost, love betrayed, and what might have been, and what might be, fall equally away with what is, and leave only these ideograms printed on the immortal hydrocarbons of flesh and stone.